So Glenn, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And when Glenn uh, graciously offered me the chance to speak and told me it was fellows, um, one of my passions is neuromodulation in the brain. And I thought, what a sort of a great group to talk to. And then I, I kind of did a flip flop and sort of thought that I would ask you, seeing great lectures both today and tomorrow with the right side of your brain. I mean, the technical stuff I'm seeing just in the 30 minutes I've been here is outstanding. But I'm going to get really left brain on all of you, which is I'm going to go way back to the lowly epidural steroid injection, which, believe it or not, you are still going to be doing those in the future, OK? Um, just because of the instance, the problem, and just share some perspectives with you on it, uh, a little bit of history. Um, and hopefully make it interesting and, and, and thought-provoking for you as well. So some things about me very briefly. I'm a neurosurgeon. We actually do spine surgery too, just like the orthopedic guys. Um, I've never performed a single injection in my life. I do order them regularly from a group of people who I trust, and those span multiple disciplines from interventional radiologists to anesthesiologists to physiatrists. I'm much more interested in a person's skill set, their perspectives, how they treat patients, uh, than their specific specialty that they're coming from. For me, injections done well and with a person I trust absolutely advise a patient's candidacy for surgery. And that's a very big deal. Um, I feel that part of the way I make decisions is working with colleagues, again, who I think can use techniques to help answer questions. I think it's also important to understand, and I'm gonna talk a bit about the patient's perspective because um, our interaction with patients is gonna to continue to be critically important. We think of maybe it's gonna become less so, but if we're gonna basically control our destiny, we certainly can't give up on our patients and treat them basically as an objective bunch of cells which we're trying to make look prettier and better. We really, have to work with them and partner with them probably in ways we didn't have to when I started 20 years ago. The relationship is much more even now with patient and physician. It used to be like this, it's now like this. You're no longer the captain of the ship, you're the manager of a very high level baseball team, which is very, very different. So let's just, again, I, I think a lot of you in 2000 were born, but you probably didn't know you wanted to be physician. So we're gonna go back in time, and I think this history is important. I know a couple of the guys in the room know this history, but we're gonna talk about 2019, then we're gonna go back a couple decades. But I want you just to look in 2019, before COVID hit, about procedures that are done in the United States, and just give you a sense of numbers, okay? As we move down here, they all make sense. Cataracts, four million a year. That's a lot of cataracts. Spinal injections, including epidural, nine million, which seems like a number that's nearly impossible. How could it be? It's a real number, okay? And it's important to recognize that comes from a lot of things, from live deliveries, epidurals, trigger point injections. Nine million is a big number, okay? So just something to keep in mind about how this is gonna be part of your life. And I would argue being expert at this process makes you expert at these things that are really cool that you're gonna also see today in terms of treating patients. So a bit of historical perspective. We're gonna go back to 2000 here, and I just want you to get a sense of how the world has changed. It's kind of a busy slide. I'm gonna have some busy slides, but I want you to see in a decade, and I would consider this kind of the decade when injections became a much more common tool that we used for our patients, okay? So if you look at the highlight in dark, you can see a 665% increase over a decade in injections. Physiatrists, rehab physicians increasing by 520%. Now in fairness to growth, if you look at a, very important study to spine surgeons, which I know Niels knows very well, by Dr. Kerrigy at Stanford and Dr. David at OHSU. Between 2000 and 2007, in the Medicare population, for a diagnosis of lumbar stenosis, instrumented spinal fusions went up during that time. So this is from a surgery perspective. From 2000 to 2007, Medicare patients with a diagnosis of lumbar stenosis, not spinalisthesis, the percent increase 
in spinal fusions was a little over 1,400%, almost 15-fold increase. And I mention this to say, as I talk a little further, is when numbers change like this so much, people start to really notice that things are changing, particularly the people who write the checks, which is the government and commercial insurance. Again, a very busy slide, which I won't go through too much, but we have this big increase in the first decade of the 21st century. And this study basically tried to look at some randomized studies that were doing, being done about spinal injections, okay? And interesting takeaways, I think, from this article, which is a comprehensive review, and we all know what the retrospectoscope is. When you look at retrospective studies that aren't all randomized, that aren't all placebo controlled, that aren't all blinded, you can glean some things, but I think it's important to glean some things from looking at the studies that existed in 2013. Again, now after this explosive growth that occurred in epidural injections. And if you look at the last point I've highlighted there, there are no clinical trials comparing different number of injections or guidelines that suggest how many injections should be done or if they should be done in a series, et cetera, okay? So explosive growth with no real guidelines that existed. Well, our friends at the Food and Drug Administration kind of took notice of this in 2014. And they released a statement that basically said, for nothing better, this is kind of a dangerous procedure. And even if you look at that past paper that I showed you about basically the 45 studies that were done on epidural injections, there's kind of this idea that perhaps these aren't quite as safe as people think they are. There's people who've had strokes, who've had fractures after steroids are introduced, loss of vision. So this comes out and that raises alarm bells and all the different groups of people who basically do epidural steroid injections. And this is basically a group of societies who all came together and said, wait a sec, um, the FDA is misguided here. Um, these are actually safe. And if you look at the alternative for spinal pain in the form of opioids and uh, non-steroidals, you look at the consequences of that, epidurals can provide really a very good option for these patients and basically asks the FDA to change their letter, which they did. But keep in mind that there are basically 14 or 15 societies that basically came together, the spine surgeons, interventional, pain, anesthesiologists, radiologists, all came together to support this letter. Now, in, in my title, it's comp Compete or Collaborate. I thought this was a good time to just say, um, quit stealing all our spine procedures, okay? <laughs> okay, we gotta make a living too. Um, no, uh, obviously I wanna talk about collaboration, but I wanna do it kind of in a parochial way, which is, um, this is the part of the left brain I want you to think about, and I want you to think about in terms of patients, patient-centric. If you're patient-centric, you're physician-centric. And physician-centric means you collaborate with your colleagues, okay? So why collaborate? Our patients. It increases safety and reduces waste. Our friends who write the checks, who are all delightful people, they are really demanding the triple aim, which is show this that this is cost effective, because they're not gonna tell you that it's cost effective. Show us quality outcomes, and show us that patients are happy. I'm gonna tell you, I put those in the order for a specific reason. That's the order in which the people who write the checks think is important. It's gotta be cost effective. You can say I can do a beautiful procedure, but you've gotta prove why in general that's saving money versus traditional ways of doing things, okay? I don't have to really go into quality outcomes and patient satisfaction why that's gonna be important. We've got to innovate to survive, okay? It's just, it's not simply because we're people who worked very hard um, and continue to work very hard, study very hard, that that somehow is gonna allow us to continue to control our own destiny. And, and I still believe that collegiality is still a good thing. I think it's good to work within my own specialty and across specialties to deal with spinal problems, which are not gonna go away anytime soon. Um, I put this slide up because this is gonna go into my piece about you and your patient and what I consider the three E's. But I, but I put these up to show you 
you will get some version of these comments on day one of your practice because patients now, because the internet exists and they still have next door neighbors and relatives, are going to tell you why they do or do not need the procedure. So understand, patients come to you with a set of biases, expectations, and plenty of misinformation or information without context that's very, very important. And understand that. And understand that you are gonna have to time, spend time and energy to do that. That simply saying that doesn't matter, et cetera, it really becomes important to understand they have a misunderstanding and miseducation. So a place you might have heard of in Rochester, Minnesota called the Mayo Clinic, this is their present, off their present flyer right now, if you were to get a spinal injection from them. And if you just take a quick look at this, and you're the patient in the waiting room or you're getting on the website or you're checking to see whether an injection is a good idea to be performed in Kentucky or Illinois or Oklahoma or Washington and saying, gee, I'm gonna check with the mayor or the Johns Hopkins website. I would look at this and say, did my doctor really send me to get that injection? And by the way, that last line, when injected near irritated nerve spines, they, it, may give a, uh, it may actually help relieve pain. It might not, it might be temporary. Again, context is everything and education of your patient becomes everything because of what's out there. So these are the three E's. The first one's obvious, and I, I think I heard Dr. Beal say this about the neurologic exam. You, you still absolutely have to go through a process. It can be an efficient process, but do not take what's written in the chart or what someone tells you, et cetera, or what the skin, you have to basically quickly and efficiently examine the patient. Then you've got to educate them, okay? What does your MRI mean? What does the word severe in your MRI mean? Can you think of any diagnosis where severe is a good thing? Never severe richness, severe happiness, right? Kind of oxymoronic. You will be stunned how much people focus on the word severe. You can give the most erudite sort of this is what's going on, they want to know why that report, which is very objective by the radiologist, said these things, okay? They'll want to know, what about physical therapy? Why is not it work? Why wouldn't I do that first? What about these medicines? How much opioid should I be in? What about Neurontin, okay? So coming in with a game plan of saying, I quickly got to understand, does this patient have a neurologic issue that I can absolutely nail down? Now I've got a lot of data, okay? Knowing that they're going to have biases based on what they've learned from the outside. The last thing is elucidate. And elucidate just simply means make clear. Why am I going to do this procedure? Why did a doctor send you to see me? Is it to help us just make you feel better? Is it gonna confirm the diagnosis? Is it a good thing if Dr. David does that injection and I get absolutely no benefit? Yes, that can be a very good thing. I can send someone to get an injection and say, it didn't help at all. I tell them ahead of time and say, this injection might not help at all. We learn a lot from that information, okay? So I think it's important to really get your patient to partner with you and say, why are we having you do this? What do we learn? Set expectations in terms of what you're trying to do. How's it gonna impact this person's quality of life? I had a patient the other day with their wife, had bad stenosis, we were gonna try an in injection, neurogenic claudication, piece of cake, right? Kind of sick, and we said, you know what, it's gonna help us understand if this stenosis is really what's keeping you from walking. And, and the husband said, well, I don't really want her to walk. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, well, we do our own thing. I go to the casino, she stays at home and watches her show, uh, I, we, I don't want her to come to the casino with me, and I'm having this conversation like, well, okay. Really set expectations with patients. And again, I don't want this to sound like, this slide to sound very laborious, right? But I think as a new physician, you're very much about risk and benefit and what exact procedure I'm gonna do, and your right side of your brain is hammering you, right? How, what is the best procedure here? Don't let your left brain die. Okay, because what's great about this meeting is it's a highly right brain technical with experts who are gonna to try to keep you very, very safe. Don't let your left brain die. It's really, really important to connect with your patients. Now, 
This is the collaborate part also, okay? Uh, when I get into the electronic medical record, which now we're fortunate in this part of the country, we have a thing called Care Everywhere, I can look across systems, et cetera, and I can basically see what doctors are thinking. But the clarity of that, that being concise, right? Why are they requesting this injection? Has everything, have other things been tried? Physical therapy, simple medications. Has that been clearly laid out in the doctor's notes? Has anyone addressed other issues related to diabetes or osteoporosis or anticoagulation, right? If we come off anticoagulation for simply for 48 hours, are we clear that that's not adding more risk or they have a terrible T-score and that injection might induce something? I want to know that the patient's aware of that. And does the patient have a firm understanding? If in a, at the end of my note, I always try to make sure it's the risk and benefits in, were discussed in detail of anything, even if I'm sending for an injection, to discuss further with Dr. David, okay? This is why we're recommending doing this versus doing nothing. So kind of trying to wrap up a lot of this left brain, okay? Uh, again, some just kind of some thoughts. It's gonna include all of us. It's gonna include physical therapists and chiropractors and other sorts of people, people who are into non-traditional forms of medicine, again, talking and speaking the same language, okay? That's, and first and foremost, that's gonna occur in the medical record, okay? The idea that you can kind of do your own thing, especially if you're gonna be working in some sort of system, right? It, you're, you're gonna, it's not gonna work. And basically, your colleagues are not gonna like it, your patients aren't gonna like it, and it's just an extinct way of doing things. You can't do things in your own little world without kind of thinking more broadly about other people you're gonna be interacting with in spine care. As I said before, the payers love to look at weaknesses in the medical record as you try to do something or try to get something. They love to look and say, well, Dr. X said this, and this hasn't, right? They are looking for basically a lack of communication between you and your patient and between you and the providers, okay? So again, thinking about how the EMR is a wonderful thing, but also has a whole set of responsibilities that go along with how you're gonna have to communicate. Thinking even more broadly, if you think about this collaboration, this collaboration can be a phone call, this collaboration can be the EMR, it can be meetings like this, it can be you sitting down with your surgical colleagues and saying, let's create a clinical pathway that we're gonna do with our patients for low back pain, for neck pain, okay? That's gonna involve these, and we're gonna do this in a way that only helps our patients, payers leave us alone and we get to take care of patients the way we want to. And we're gonna look at cost effectiveness, quality outcomes and patient satisfaction. That's where the enjoyment really comes and it's basically also protecting us so we can still do what we wanna do. So trying to really just wrap this up quickly, educate, communicate precisely. Talk to your colleagues. Okay, I, I, I just, I think that's impor really important. Thing. One of the reasons I come into work after 20 some years of doing this is because I bump into people and work with people that I like to. It makes the job much more interesting and the patients really benefit that on that. I'll hit this again to beat a dead horse. Innovate care that's cost effective and based on quality outcomes. You guys can be technical geniuses Right? You can put that cement exactly where it needs to be. You can be on the cutting edge of neuromodulation and reciprocal stimulation for pain. But we don't want to all become engineers, I don't think. We don't want our degree to be a medical engineer degree and no longer be a medical doctor degree because if we don't innovate care that's cost effective, we will become engineers. The, the worry I think many of us gray hairs have is that eventually we'll be told, this is what you're going to do with this patient because the AI has told us that's what you, are you interested? Because if you're not, the next person is. We gotta take charge of this as best we can, okay? Thank you. Any quick, any quick, any, we're, we're behind I know, so any quick questions? Sir. 
Um, thank you for the talk, really great. So what do you think about the position statement about uh, neurosurgeons, um, about arthrodesis of the spine by non-intervention, by non-surgeons, by non interventionalists? Right out of the box, right? Body <laughs> block! Go for the, go for the jugular. <laughs> you know, neurosurgeons are generally a very friendly group. Um, and here's, here's what I would say. And again, I think you have to remember statements made by organizations and the colleagues you're going to be working with. Okay, and I'm not. This is an ex exact correlate, but about a decade ago, the trauma surgeons tried to tell the world through the American College that they were going to do burr holes because there weren't enough neurosurgeons. They were going to do the burr holes because we don't have neurosurgeons who want to take call. And the neurosurgeons wrote a position statement, et cetera. Okay. Um, I, I, if the question is, do I think innovating less interventional ways of creating arthrodesis is the way things are going to move? Yes. But please don't expect the neurosurgeons not to behave like neurosurgeons. And, and at the end of the day, let's even, you know, there's a, there's a slide I sometimes put up during a talk that says, when dessert gets smaller, table manners go away. Okay? <laughs> they go away, right? Which is, um, when I see you kind of coming into my room here to take what I have traditionally thought was mine, my natural instinct is not going to be, let's share dessert. It's going to be, it's my dessert. You just have to understand that in the basis of what it is. But I think what we really have to do is take a step back and say, let's really look at risk, benefit, cost effectiveness of these different ways of doing things. I, I, I'm a realist about spine surgery. I love it, but I'm a realist about it. Okay, my always my comment would be about people doing spine interventions, and this and I and I loved your comment about the retropulsion. Okay, anything you do, be able to get yourself out of. Now I want to be clear about that. Let's say, despite your best efforts, you get extravasation, and that extravasation just follows a nerve root, and a person says, I, I, I got terrible radicular pain before. And you look at the skin, you go, I've got a stalactite running right under the, and you guys know this, right? I got a stalactite running right under the nerve root, okay? As long as you've collaborated with your spine surgeon and said, hey, I got a stalactite and this is a pretty easy fix for you, just need you to go in and get that plastic out of there because there's no other really good way to do it than with open surgery, you're good, right? So your question's really about the position statement. It's a classic position statement by the neurosurgeons. Okay, it, and, and don't expect that those things wouldn't happen in, in, as, as fields start to cross each other. We will get those questions answered, but let's not have it make us be enemies in this. So it, it, what do you expect? It's from the AANS, right? I mean, that's an organization designed to protect neurosurgeons. That has no relationship between, and, and I poo-poo this all the time, and, and, and Pete and I would sit down and have a couple of beers, and I, I would say, that's ridiculous. He'd say, yeah, you know, my organization does the same thing. But that has no effect on what we do and how we try to advance the bar and treat patients. And everything that he just said is fantastic talk, right? I mean, Thank this you. is what we need to do by doing something that's cost effective. It's also, it has to be effective, less invasive. You come in, you do something you do to your own mother. This is how we think. The organizations, they're protectionistic. And that's not going away at all. And wh what we do is we try to, what uh, all of us here are trying to do, Dr. Sean Arden and I, try to paper it up to the point it's beyond the pale. I mean, it's, so I don't care what your non-randomized, non-placebo controlled study of your own opinion is. Here's what the data says. And this is why we do what we do. So this is kind of the world in which we live in. And that kind of stuff is, but boy, I lo you came out with a haymaker to the neurosurgeon. I, I love that. That was, that I was, felt a, the that body was a nice blow. move. <laughs> yeah, and th so, so great, great points. When you get into the world that you're going to be living in, there'll be some surly spine surgeons on the orthopedic side. And the nurse, but you'll find people who say, let's get a couple beers or a cup of coffee. You name it. I like beer more than coffee, but that's just me. But say, let's talk about this. And you'll find someone go like, eh. But you will find people who are like-minded because this is the future, okay? The reason I pay dues to the AANS is I'm going to try to protect <laughs> my piece of dessert.
Okay. The complication too. I mean, you're talking about complications. So my best colleagues are my surgeon colleagues. They're my uh, friends and my best colleagues. Because yeah, I mean, uh, certain things we do, we need to be bailed out. There's certain things they do, they need to be bailed out. And so all you have to do is, you know, have a little bit of quid pro quo. Hey man, would you mind? And that's the point in time you got to step and say, no problem. I got you, got you covered. Don't worry about it. And that's a good collaborative relationship. That's how patients do better. That's how the division of labor happens. And, you know, you can't be everything to everybody, but you sure can do what you do to the best of your ability and be open to collaboration. There is always like this allegory between interventional cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons and how can we develop the same relationship because like uh, interventionists are going to have complications and they're going to need to be bailed out and cardiothoracic surgeons are more than happy to help them. Like a uh, 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 cardiologist can drain a pericardial tamponade in most instances. So how can we reach to that point? Yeah. The question, last question over there. Uh, great talk. What is the role of societies like Circuit Spine Pain Society, these new multi, multidisciplinary societies in helping advance the conversation quickly to the point where we can get more of our patients access to these innovative therapies, whereas instead of just discussing in this room, kind of having more open conversation so that way, you know, we can I think those societies are just about are about that, really raising this at a different level nationally. But I will I would argue all politics is local. I mean, I can tell you about brutal battles of neurosurgeons and vascular surgeons for carotid and arterectomy. And it turns into, I mean, again, I don't I don't want to get too far afield with the question. Think locally about this. Because you can take those local relationships and you can say, and now I want to elevate this on more of a national scene through these societies. But you have to find ways where you are, basically to prove the concept. To the point of, right, you create the white paper that says we've done this together, and these are our outcomes, and it's more cost effective than doing a T10 to L2 for a compression fracture. It's, you can debate all you want to. If, the, if you have the data there, you have the data. Well, I do have to say, you know, well, best years of, in my career has been collaborating with surgeons like, like Peter Nora. You know, I had that strong collaboration uh, and a team, uh, team approach to the patient uh, can be quite helpful. And, uh, but uh, as, uh, as um, Dr. Beal was uh, mentioning, in doing the different procedures that we do, uh, we're going to have problems with, and complications. You're going to have a hematoma uh, you know, from your epidural. You're going to have a hematoma from your typhoplasty in the thoracic spine. These things happen. And having friends and colleagues that can help you in times like that is, is, is very important. Okay.